Inside Africa, in association with Zenith Bank. South Africa is home to many of the world's most endangered species. Of these endangered animals, the rhino and the buffalo, the lion and the leopard, and of course, the African elephant are known as the big five. But what about the little guys? The vast majority of resources have gone to these large charismatic species and the less noticeable species have unfortunately been left behind. A vital effort is underway to recognize the lesser known, though equally vulnerable, reptiles, amphibians, and fish among us, including the world's most endangered seahorse. They're super special because they endemic. They only occur in southern Africa and they only occur in the Nizhny region. So that's why they're also listed as endangered. Very, very special little animals. Meet the people fighting for the tiny and neglected by educating the public about how big and vital they really are. Most of life on Earth is actually found in the little things. Without them, ecosystems wouldn't function and the large mammals and birds that we are so familiar with wouldn't survive. These are the little five. This is Inside Africa. South Africa is home to a spectacular array of wildlife, many of them protected and preserved in national parks. But when it comes to the most endangered frogs and lizards in the world, the situation is critical. The International Union for the Conservation of Nature places species like these on their red list. This red list basically is used to catalog, ideally, all known biodiversity um, around the world. And so it assesses, whatever, based on the available information, um, where species live and the potential threats that they're being faced with, um, and categorizes them from least concerned to various um, levels of threat status and or endangered or extinct. The fight to save species from extinction requires the cooperation of many organizations. This is perhaps best illustrated by the coordinated efforts to save the first of our little five, the critically endangered Pickard's Gills reed frog. Some of these elusive amphibian were collected 12 years ago from one of the shrinking wetland habitats it occupies along a narrow stretch of the KwaZulu-Natal coastline and brought here to the Johannesburg Zoo. Zoos plays an enormous role in conservation because we can get inside information of the life of animals and the behavior that's very difficult to understand and observe in the natural habitat. And also we can create sustainable populations here that we can breed on demand and ensure that the genetics are absolutely brilliant and the best that's available and to assist with breeding these species to put them back into the wild and ensure that generations to come can still see these animals in the natural habitat. The plan to reintroduce captive bred frogs back into the wild was started in partnership with KwaZulu-Natal Wildlife Conservation Agency. This frog was the most critically threatened frog in South Africa. It was designated as critically endangered at one stage and we wanted to ensure that it did not go extinct. The translocation process is painstakingly hands-on as these minute creatures are labeled and prepared for their journey to the release site. To relocate the species of amphibia is not an easy process. First of all, we had to identify healthy adult species that can go back into the wild. It's very important, if we take a male and female out as a starting product, we have to put the male and female back, and of course, the offspring, because they would have bred in the wild as well. 
The captive-bred frogs have all been injected with a substance that will glow if ultraviolet light shines on them, allowing them to be tracked. The translocation period between here and Mount Moreland is about a seven and a half hour drive. Automatically will take us a little bit longer because we have to stop on a regular basis and make sure that the frogs are 100% fine. These guys are going back to the areas where we found them. After a 600 kilometer journey, the team and their 200 tiny passengers arrive the next morning at Mount Moorland and meet the KwaZulu-Natal team, led by Dr. Adrian Armstrong. We bring the frogs out and put them in the cages and hang them up on some of the vegetation here so that they can um, kind of adapt to the temperature and humidity here. The plan to reintroduce so many captive-bred frogs back into this tiny habitat is not without its challenges. It's all of them made it, there's no problems, and I must say the frogs actually are quite happy here with these warmer temperatures because they used to be kept at about 24, 25, 26 degrees Celsius, and it's exactly what we're feeling now at the moment here in Mount Moreland. Frogs play a vital role in nature's ecosystem, serving not only as pest controllers and important sources of food, but also because of their sensitivity to environmental changes. Frogs are very important indicators of the environment because their skins are generally permeable, so they are affected by what's in the water and what's in the air. Following the successful release of the Pickersgill reed frogs raised in captivity, the team attempts to gather more specimens from another site near the harbor. Unlike the Mount Moreland site, this area is unprotected and heavily polluted. It soon becomes clear they'll need to try one last remaining site. In what might seem an unlikely spot, they find what they're looking for, right in the middle of one of Durban's townships. This is a wonderful wetland. You can see it hasn't been burned for a long time. It's got a very thick understory, got lots of uh, different plant species. And as you could see, we were quite deep in water at times, and that's ideal conditions for this frog to breed in and to live in. So the best thing is to wait till it's dark, because then the males and females tend to climb up the reeds, and then it's much easier to see them in your torchlight. Pickersgill's reed frogs have very specific habitat requirements and are only found in a few small, highly fragmented wetlands along the coast of KwaZulu-Natal. These researchers say boosting this population is vital. The Johannesburg Zoo has been studying and uh, breeding specimens of, from, from amphibians for the last 12 years, and this is still only the beginning. Across the world, there is an increasing awareness of the endangered animals around us. Yet, the tiny creatures in our oceans don't seem to get the same love. Perhaps the best example is the Nizna seahorse. Another of our little five, it's the world's most endangered seahorse species and only found in three of South Africa's river estuaries, as well as here, inside Cape Town's Two Oceans Aquarium. So seahorses overall are amazing because they're mystical and mythical and strange and wonderful. And um, you know, people are intrigued by it. It's like a, like a fairy tale animal. And uh, they've been around for millions of years. So they're fossils of 13 million years ago of seahorses, which is fascinating. The mysterious seahorse is considered a fish, but are quite unlike any other fish species. They evolved um, into their current shape purely because they adapted to sort of more shallow water, seabeds with seagrass. Then there are about 44, 45 other different seahorse species that you find you know, all over the world. But yeah, the nice new seahorse, I mean, as South Africans, we can be proud of these little ambassadors. Captive breeding programs of this unusual sea creature have been underway since the first specimens arrived here 20 years ago. I think these guys are now about ninth generation captive bred. 
So what we do find is, is they do have a really good survivability in, in an aquarium. But obviously we can really control those parameters in terms of your water temperature, salinities, pHs. We keep everything in range and we feed them really well. A seahorse does not have a functional stomach, so they've got to graze all the time, they can't store food. So we offer, I always call it, we offer them six star accommodation. It's a hotel, yeah. They do um, tend to live a lot longer. The population here started with four males and five females and has grown to around 150. The breeding program has allowed some of the offspring to be sent to other aquariums in South Africa and other countries. We've never had to go back and source them from the wild. So since then we've been able to captive breed and keep this population going, which is really nice for an aquarium because that means we've got a sustainable population right here. We've got no impact on the ocean. The seahorse is unusual in many respects. It's a fish without scales. It has skin and swims upright. But there's something else remarkable about them. I think one of the most um, interesting facts would be the fact that the males carry the eggs. So in human terms, we can say the dads are pregnant and not the moms. They tangle their little tails and they move up into the water column and the female will deposit her eggs into the male's pouch and then the job's done. And within the next day, she will go and flirt with somebody else, gently. They carry those eggs, depending on species and temperature, anything from two weeks to, to a month. When the tiny seahorses are ready to be born, the male undergoes muscular contractions to expel the young from his pouch. They contract and then like 10 or 20 babies will pop out. And then the male will literally like relax like, ah and then wait for a while and then the next batch will come out and they'll have anything from I mean 10 to one and a half thousand babies depending on size, species, age, all of that but it's amazing to watch. While seahorse fathers take the reins in childbirth the parents do not provide their tiny offspring with any care or protection after they are born fully formed. In fact if that little baby doesn't get away quickly enough the parent or the uncle might come and eat it. So the survival rate of these babies is very low. Maybe five out of a thousand will survive to adulthood. While the Johannesburg Zoo's success in the captive breeding of amphibians, like the reed frog, has allowed them to be reintroduced into the wild, this type of release program has been impossible with the Nisna seahorse. Two problems. If you start a very small population already, you, you get a lot of genetic interbreeding if you have a captive population, which means you might be putting weaker ones back into the, into the wild. And the second one being, and the saddest thing being, with increased pollution levels, what we're really doing is destroying their home. They've got nowhere else to live. So if you destroy that area, and at some stage the tolerance gets such that they can't actually tolerate the parameters anymore, you actually don't have a friendly place to put them back into. We really wouldn't want to um, introduce an animal back into the natural space that brought something that that resident population wasn't used to and then wiped out the whole resident population when we were trying to do something good by bulking up the resident population. These animal scientists say major habitat reclamation efforts are needed before the future improves for these wild populations. We find tropical seahorses and coral reefs and coral reefs are dying out. Um, sea cross beds are dying out, so the less environment there is for them, the less chance of them surviving. Nisner seahorses were the first seahorse specimens to be classified as endangered and serve as a symbol for all of the sea's threatened and endangered creatures. They've got the sea factor, which is exactly that cute factor. So something that people can relate to, can identify to, and actually almost can individualize. So people are attracted to, to something special, but ultimately that animal represents all animals. And, and for us, our vision and our mission really is, is, let's look after our oceans, let's look after our planet, because we want to save every species. As long as something inspires people to care, we're winning through that. Over the last decade, 
Endangered animals like the rhino and its ever-decreasing numbers have drawn media attention, as have the conservation efforts focused on saving them. The same can't be said of our little five, some of the smaller, scalier, and less well-known species fighting to survive. Tyrone Ping is a South African blogger and photographer who has been fascinated by snakes, reptiles, and amphibians since he was a child. I started, um, you know, going out in the field collecting snakes, reptiles, chameleons, anything like that. And then as I got older, I started, you know, f photographing more animals. And then as that progressed, photographing more animals outside of where I'm from, traveled the whole of, sort of Southern Africa, and then slowly built up a big repertoire of um, images of animals all across Southern Africa. One of the more unusual species he has photographed is an elusive legless lizard. Perhaps the most endangered of our little five, it's known as the Durban Dwarf Burrowing Skink. Um, I have found them on a, on a few sites uh, in the south of Durban, um, and they're, they're relatively difficult to photograph. They're very small animals, they sort of move erratically, and they just want to burrow into the sand uh, most of the time. So they are very difficult to photograph, so you do need a lot of patience. The teams from the Johannesburg Zoo and SM Velo KwaZulu Natal Wildlife are also searching for the critically endangered skink. They are hoping to find enough to begin a captive breeding program. We want to try and collect a couple to take back to the Johannesburg Zoo and breed them so that we can release these babies, if they have babies, into the wild. The plan to gather specimens proves easier said than done. The reason it is classified as critically endangered is because it exists in such a small area that is rapidly urbanizing and so all its habitat is being destroyed or um, degraded through urbanization and associated human activities. It's been very difficult to find them and we do uh, rely on um, word of mouth. We came here because someone told us that they were turning over bits of concrete here and they found a few. These are legless lizards they're very difficult to catch and they're very fast. The Johannesburg crew are thorough and meticulous in their search. And their patience pays off. The challenge facing the team back at the zoo will be providing these specimens with what they need to breed so that, like the Pickersgill's reed frog, this legless lizard can become the next captive breeding success story. We need to know a lot more and here the zoo can play a a valuable role in finding out more about the life history so we understand more about their habits and so we can conserve them better. Another elusive lizard that couldn't be more different to the burrowing skink is the fourth on our little list of endangered species. It's the Natal Midlands dwarf chameleon. There are 17 described species of dwarf chameleons across southern Africa and only a handful of those are well documented. If you go into Google and type in South African chameleons, only a small percentage of those are really well documented. So I made it my mission to travel across the length and breadth of South Africa to find and photograph all of the described species of chameleons. Photographer Tyrone Ping has provided much needed proof of life with his camera. He's contributed many of his photographs to international scientific journals and websites. I want to contribute my images so other people can see, you know, the variations and more, more of the species across, across the country. And most of the academics are really grateful for any insights, particularly with um, records like photographic records or new geographical records that they may have not come across before. What is clear to enthusiasts like Tyrone and to scientists is that these little lizards face multiple threats. Its biggest threat is habitat loss and um, transformation and fragmentation. So it currently resides in a highly transformed area where it used to reside in forests. And now there's very few fragments of that natural forest left. A lot of their natural habitat is now being sort of destroyed and they're left with very small fragmented pockets where they survive in, you know, things like hedgerows and tree lines. They need sort of corridors to move freely. You know, they can't exist in a single tree and then, you know, 100 meters down the road there's another tree. They need to be able to move freely from sort of hedge to hedge, you know, where they can't be seen by predators. Along with habitat loss and a host of natural predators these chameleons have to contest with, 
there is also another threat, humans. The illicit illegal trade and the black market trade of these animals, you know, illegally leaving the country, going overseas to Europe, to the US and all over the world actually, um, creates a major problem and a threat to these animals from being um, collected from the wild, you know, depleting the wild populations. And you know, once, once these animals are taken from a particular area, they can become locally extinct. The illegal pet trade that has diminished dwarf chameleon populations is also threatening the final of our little five the magnificent sun gazer. It is one of the species being closely studied by the conservation group, the Endangered Wildlife Trust. The sun gazer lizard, also known as the giant dragon lizard and by various other names, um, its Latin name is Smog giganteus. This is a species that is endemic to South Africa. It doesn't occur anywhere else in the world. Sun gazers are traded globally as pets. Um, unfortunately, they are highly sought after being large spiky lizards the species will be impacted by trade in wild individuals so we've we've shut down all that trade the dangerous creatures exhibit at ushaka marine world in durban plays a valuable role in creating awareness of threatened species like the sun gazer we've had them since inception of dangerous creatures which is over 10 years now, and they sit on top of their burrows looking up into the sun. That's where they get their name from. Really awesome animals. You know, for people to see an animal like that in an exhibit, then they're not going to see animals like this anywhere, really. Very few people have actually seen these animals. Sun gazers don't breed in captivity. And even if we manage to get it right, they breed very slowly. They only have one or two young every second year. It is our duty to protect the species. As scientists and conservationists continue to fight for some of the smallest species, they say the challenge ahead is still large for our little five, and for us. I think the concept of trying to explain biodiversity to everyone is a very difficult one because if it was that easy, everyone would appreciate it. Wherever we've got an endangered part of that system, we should do what we can to preserve it because that helps us preserve that whole ecosystem. Never before have we been so aware of our impact on the environment. And again, it takes that, that C factor, those cute, strange, weird, mystical little animals to remind people like, do good, because then the next generation and in 200 years time, they'll still be around. Just the fact that, that humans actually really care, it gives me a lot of hope. Inside Africa, in association with Zenith Bank.